Thanks so much, Donna, and thanks uh, to Kate and the rest of the mixed team for extending this invitation. It's, um, it's, it's, it's thrilling to be invited to keynote to such an interesting collection of people doing such interesting work. Um, so how are you doing? You feeling well mixed? <laughs> Still awake, just about? Well, I'll try and keep you awake for another hour. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to quite tap dance my way into the cocktail hour, but I hope you'll find what I have to say uh, entertaining and um, illuminating. Um, I'm mainly going to talk about art, um, which is unusual for me because uh, it's not a word that springs easily to my lips because I'm more interested in popular culture, actually. But um, mainly what I'm going to be talking about is um, art. And I'm going to be drawing on um, work from the Ambient Literature Project. Um, I have a paper which I'll be reading from, but I'll also jump about a bit. A few weeks ago, I was having an adventure in France. I was visiting some old friends that I hadn't seen for 20 or 30 years, one of whom lives up a mountain in the middle of nowhere. The car hire had a built-in French sat-nav. My travelling companions had lent me a UK sat-nav. I had Google Maps on my phone and a road atlas. But I'm not actually a very systematic driver. I often arrive by one route and leave by another. And when I'm having an adventure, I want to be able to wander. I want to be able to follow my nose. I want to be able to take the scenic route. So on this morning between the Pyrenees and Roussillon, the first part of my day was spent in an extended struggle with the GIS systems that enmeshed me in its logics to drive by the fastest, but not the most direct or indeed the most interesting route. I was drawn into the boring suburbs of Perpignan. I don't want to go on the payage. Was I on my route or was I on the machine's route? I didn't know. So I stopped and I pulled out the road atlas from under the seat and I wrote down a series of town names and road numbers and I put on some music and I enjoyed the drive. I was a bit late, but hey, this was the south of France and it was a May Day holiday. It all worked out fine. I found my old friend at the top of a mountain and filled in 30 years of life history. There's now an app for doing a derive. Did you know that? You can download an app to do a derive. That object actually is the critical locus of the conversation that I want to have with you, I suppose. It's actually not as bad as it seems. I advise you, you know, go and check it out. It asks you to do some interesting <coughs> tasks and to report back, and it keeps a map of where you've been, and you can share, share derives with other people. It's not quite as silly as it sounds, but it's an interesting symbolic problem. I want to start off with some critical framing, talking about digital creativity and where the impetus behind a conference like this comes from and where we are in this moment of the digital creative economy. For nearly 20 years since Cool Britannia, creativity in general and digital creativity in particular have been valorised as a driver of economic growth, social cohesion and well-being. The cultural industries were invented to offer a global competitive advantage to UK PLC and increasingly a kind of social pedagogy. Creativity has become industrialised. But it seems to me that the idea of the creative economy is running out of steam. In the area, sorry, in the era of fake news, algorithmic surveillance and the data-driven industrialisation of precarity, the golden sheen of a creative economy looks like a burnt-out hulk of Blairite supernova in a constellation of austerity. Since the crash of 2008, it's become increasingly obvious that there is no creative transformation of the economy on offer. The promise of digital has dissolved in the monopolization of attention by Google, Facebook, and the other massively overvalued attention farmers. And any democratizing forces that we may have held dear have been cruelly exposed by Snowden, Assange, and Chelsea Manning. Instead of the creative transformation of the economy, we have Uberization and Deliveroo, armies of freelance pop-ups in the gig economy where it's best not to get sick, have children, or want holidays. 
So we're in a new era, it seems to me, of critical digital humanities rather than advocacy-based digital humanities, where the post-Marxist critical analysis of the cultural industries that have always been part of our world suddenly have some real purchase. Even a stuck clock is right twice a day. We've gone from the utopian promise of Web 2.0 to the necessity for air-gapped machines in 10 years. Do you know what air-gapped machines are? How many of you know what those are? Computers that have never been on the internet, so that no one can track you. And that's what you have if you're a cool Silicon Valley employee these days. The post-Snowden era of Cambridge Analytics is a challenging and dark place. And for every global success story, there's a thousand failed startups stumbling along in what Sebastian Ulmer calls digital tailorism in his account of the way that the radical potential of co-working spaces have been cor become corporate designs for the exploitation of workers' passion and creative energies. So it's against this background that we need to consider the idea of immersion. Immersion's become a very popular word in the last two years. Uh, and I'm really interested in thinking about that from a political economy point of view. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, Gartner, they're future forecasters in the tech world, and they produce this wonderful graph every year uh, of the hype cycle. Uh, here you have the innovation trigger, uh, and, and uh, some tech gets conceptualized, invented, we might even say. Uh, goes up into a peak of inflated expectations, and then it plummets into the trough of disillusion before reaching the slope of enlightenment and gradually finding its way over here to economic sustainability. And actually, it's a, really, it's a tool that's designed to help investment decisions. So actually, if you're an investor, you might put small money in here to see what happens, uh, you won't put any money in around here because you know it's going to die. But if, you, if, if, things are still, if companies are still surviving down here, they're probably worth putting money in because they might get to here. That's the, that's the basic theory of, 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 of how that works. And you can see VR is climbing the slope of enlightenment. Who knew? <laughs> VR according to Gartner, is finding its way to economic sustainability. VR has been with us for a very long time, produced by a kind of deep technological imaginary that produces what Evgeny Morozov calls technological solutionism as the antidote to life's psychic ills and post-industrial economic malaise. This shows how... Um, Immersion in Google Trends has increased as a search term from 2012 to 2017. It's steadily increasing in its usage. What's going on? Why are we so interested in being immersed? Why are we getting more and more interested in being immersed? What's this about? My first encounter with VR was in 1991 in East Berlin at the Berlin Film Festival. Uh, it was a, a, an installation booth that looked a bit like this, though I was nowhere near as elegant in my attempt to use it. Uh, the VR installation that, that I was strapped into involved me having a great big glove put on my hand and the goggles and the tether being inside a, a kind of a, an area like that, an encased zone, attended by young women in, in all white uh, outfits and having to go and catch things that were kind of coming at me from deep space, which turned out to be small packets of Marlborough because the installation was sponsored by... Uh, Marble by <laughs> Philip, Philip, Philip Morris Tobaccos. Um, the recent rebirth in the fortunes of VR have one significant point of origin, I think. Um, whilst microelectronic um, developments have solved some of the early tech problems that VR had in the 90s, there was a much bigger moment in the history of VR, which was um, Facebook's purchase of Palmer Luckey's Oculus Rift technology for $2 billion in 2014. And this set off a feeding frenzy amongst the investors for whom the Gartner hype cycle is designed. Any projects, even bad ones, with the whiff of the magic of immersion in VR were ripe for investment. And why not? It's been clear that despite claims that VR could be used for education, 
training and the production of empathy. Um, the market for VR will be in hooking up young men to virtual game worlds distributed through platforms like Steam. It's seductive, after all, to, if you're a young man, to want to not be in the actual world where your body doesn't do what you want, doesn't look how you want, and where there are no rules or points for social behaviour. It's an immensely appealing fantasy, which we'll see played out in the Spielberg movie Ready Player One that's going to come out, I think, later this year. So I think it's important, before we get drowned in the bath of immersion, to remind ourselves of some of the critiques uh, that have been long-standing around the idea of immersion in virtual worlds. Firstly, it's infantilizing. Donald Winnicott um, has demonstrated the importance of play in developing adult, healthy adult psyches. He identified this idea of a kind of third space between the infant and the world, a space of playful interaction that some people, including me, have used to discuss and valorise the widespread development of gaming and play in the contemporary cultural space. But when it comes to VR, it seems to me we need to remember the Winnicottian analysis in a bit more detail. His position was that this space of playful interaction helps the child separate from the world precisely because it does not bend to the child's omnipotent will. Entities in the non-virtual world offer stubborn resistance. They cannot always be gamed. Here is a total world that is designed to keep us in a state of infantilization. Secondly, VR has been seen by feminist critics as, a as part of a long male Cartesian fantasy that's based on leaving the body behind. This interpretation of VR sees it as another version of a disembodied platonic Hev or heavenly world that uh, is a particularly male way of exerting dominance in the world by placing the here and now in the surface of uh, 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 the rules of a place far, far away that they have privileged access to. Thirdly, the tradition that starts with Brecht and has a line that traces itself through critical net art and critical gaming practices, that immersion is precisely what artists should resist in their work. That immersion is a dangerous state of ideological complicity that should be punctured, poked and perturbed so that the people formerly known as the audience are reminded that the work, the text and the experience is in permanent dialogue with the world in order to engage us not with the fantasy but to return us to the world with a heightened sense of engagement, engagement and mobilisation with and for one another. So what I want to do now is to persuade you of the virtue of uh, mixed reality works rather than virtual reality works. Um, I think there's a big um, bubble around VR that will burst and I think the future is in thinking about MR, mixed reality, and thinking about how these, in, in a very broad frame, thinking about how data and, and te digital, digital tech mixes in with our day-to-day -day lives in the world in a much more open way. So as you will have heard in the introduction, you will have heard earlier on today some of, from some of my colleagues in the Ambient Literature Project, um, we are um, uh, working on this a project called Ambient Literature, which halfway through, it's with Bath Spa colleagues and with Birmingham Uni colleagues, uh, an investigation into the potential for situated literary experiences. And I apologise for those of you in the session this morning, there might be a bit of repetition just at this precise moment, but hopefully not afterwards. Um, we've got a team of researchers with expertise in the history of the book and the future of reading, as well as on the history and practice of what emerged in the noughties as the field of locative media. Um, we're producing three um, pieces of uh, creative work. Um, it must have been Dark by Then, which is Duncan Speakman's work, which you've had a chance to uh, sample today. And, uh, and ne the next piece is by a writer called James Attlee, who's a very much a, a place-based writer, and he's writing a kind of diasporic uh, family history based in London that will involve several hours of navigating London, uh, the South Bank in London, which launches in, the, um, in September. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, our, our own Kate Pullinger, your own, Bath Spa's own, Kate Pullinger is writing a piece uh, which will be set in a room and which will have some re re relationship to thinking about uh, migration and refugees and so on. 
So we've uh, been producing these pieces of work and we're investigating those, we're investigating what users do with those and we're thinking about the whole field and we're incorporating that into various kinds of publication. This project is prompted by the fact that we're entering into a new phase of pervasive computing where its daily presence becomes banal. For most citizens, this means a taken for granted reliance on geographical information systems in the form of sat-nav, in vehicles, or Google Maps on handheld devices. These services and infrastructures that have come to pass since the advent of the iPhone include the, also include, I should say, the invisible systems of tracking, sensing, and actuating technologies that constitute urban traffic flows, global flight control, military defense systems, and many types of supply chain, including, for instance, food and medicine. Here, locative systems are also part of bigger, ubiquitous computing and Internet of Things systems. They're linked by context-aware objects that can capture data about their immediate environment and combine it with GPS data to create an illusion of contextual awareness. However, these infrastructures are dominated by a computer science definition of context. That's to say how a device knows where it is, its direction of travel, its temperature, and so on. The focus tends to ignore or parenthesizes the human users and their contextual awareness, or indeed the way that we know that in humanity is the way that we know that context determines interpretation. And that hints at one of the reasons why I designed this project around the idea of ambient literature and not locative media. My first objection to, to, the, to the locative tag is, is purely trivial, actually. <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like the word. It's ugly. Nobody knows how you should say it. Is it locative or is it locative? It arrives in the mouth unable to describe its academic pretension. And it's hard to imagine anybody walking into, a, into anywhere and saying, I want a yard of locative media, please. <laughs> Uh, secondly, I, I, I don't like uh, 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 the, the idea of locative media for the fact that it, um, uh, it has a canon that's kind of emerged around it that um, makes an assumption that locative media does oral history. Um, projects like the seminal urban tapestries that ran in London about 15 years ago or Murmur from, from um, Canada um, use the affordance of GPS to tag people's stories about place to the place where it happened. Now, whether made as a participatory project or as a carefully crafted artist work, like, for instance, Terry Rubb's core sample, these sonic cultural archaeologies have become a reductively defining subgenre, I think. In truth, they're merely a, a differently delivered form of museum guide or heritage app. And I want more from this form than a pedestrian audio guide where the correspondence between the site and the information is indexical in the sense of this happened here, look here on your left, uh, here is something happening over here that you need to pay attention to. Thirdly, and this brings in technology, I don't like the implication that I've always taken from the idea of the locative, that the content is tied to place through a particular idea of GPS. In fact, we can deliver contextually dependent content using not just GPS systems, but for instance RFID, QR, beacons, accelerometers, compasses, cameras, microphones, all of which can be used to trigger content. And this array, and it's changing all the time, uses a far more tricksy set of opportunities for interaction and engagement than simple Google Maps, Google, Google Maps blue dot form of content delivery. So at a theoretical level, the, the project is occupying a space where literary practice, locative technology, and the idea of ambience overlap. So next I want to talk about the idea of ambience for a moment. It is really useful... Uh, 2013 essay against ambience, the sonic artist and critic Seth Kim Cohen offers us a critical history of the recent construction of, of the ambient. His history of the ambient locates it as a, mu as a musical and sound art practice, recently paralleled in heightened interest in the immersive affect of ambient visual art exemplified by the success of people like James Turrell and uh, Olafur Eliasson. Kim Cohen problematizes these traditions in favor of what he argues is the critical discursive mode of conceptual art practices. The appeal of ambient phenomena, he says, is attributed to their evanescence, in ineffability, and immersiveness. They appeal, he says, through their effacement of critical art practices such as feminism, post-colonialism, relational art, and social aesthetics, offering us instead what he rather wonderfully terms inchoate spaces of womb essence. 
However, in this reading, the ambient is mute. It seeks not to communicate through language. Yet our project is literary. It's all about using language within the context of situated ambient awareness. So maybe our work is more aligned with some of the ideas arising from Timothy Morton's work, who developed the idea of ambient poetics in his 2007 book, Ecology Without Nature. Without doing too much detail on Morton here, um, he makes a different kind of proposition, which includes the interesting um, idea, deep ecology proposes that if ecological politics is to succeed, a truly ecological sub subjectivity needs to be established. It is in this spirit that I offer the notion of ambience for consideration. An ecological subjectivity, he says, requires ambience. Now, it's actually frequently not clear from Morton's book whether he likes the idea of ambience or what kind of ambience he approves of and how he feels about ambience, but that notion that actually an ecological subjectivity requires an, a, a sense of ambience seems important to the work that we've been trying to do. Morton uses the idea of uh, echomi echomimesis. Strong echomimesis, he says, purports to evoke the here and now of writing. It is an inside-out form of situatedness rhetoric. Rather than try and describe where I'm coming from, I invoke where I am. The reader glimpses the environment rather than the person. So here he's writing, and he works a lot with the romantic uh, movement. He's writing about um, writers who try to evoke a sense of place, place-based writing through their work. Morton's ambient poetics seems to me to be looking for experiences that produce a heightened awareness of the entities, human, technological, animal, architectural, that constitute our worlds. Uh, an, an awareness through which the human subject is decentered and repositioned in order to produce the conceptual conditions for ecological awareness and action. In a passage picked up by Kim Cohen, I think really applicable to our project, Morton, who is, at this point is arguing against Brian Eno's narrow version of the ambient, says, surely, uh, he says, um, Brian Eno, forget Brian Eno's world of the ambient, surely common land or a street corner or in our times of racist arrests and of Miles Davis's on the corner, a strongly ambient work, or Westminster Bridge are more potent spaces for thinking about ambient work. So our task is to try to bring some of these debates to bear not on white cube art practices or indeed 19th century literary criticism, but on the contemporary world where our ambience, our environment and our atmosphere is already being mediatized through the wireless digital communications and data systems uh, that we use every day. In our case, we seek not for the reader to glimpse the environment of the writer, but for the text to address the contextual environment of the reader. Our task is to use language, writing, the very forms of, that historic accounts of ambience have erased to produce an experience that uses ubiquitous computing to connect users to their world. And here's a long quote about uh, 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 the aesthetics of um, urban computing, which finishes up with, um, framing the city as a source of experience rather than a source of trouble raises the design question, how are information technologies implicated in the aesthetics of everyday practices. The city in its smart city formulation is often formulated as a site of trouble, as a site to be controlled. Smart cities are often about um, traffic management, essentially, energy management, um, waste flow, those kinds of issues. Now, traffic management, waste flow, energy, they're all important, but maybe we could do something else. Uh, and as this quote says, framing the city not as a source of trouble, but as a source of um, mutual and reciprocal uh, experiences for one another. Uh, and this, uh, these images are from the movie Her, where the hero um, has these uh, extraordinary kind of experiences trying to connect with other people out of his computerized bubble. Sometimes I look at people and I make myself try and feel them as more than just a random person walking by. I imagine how deeply they've fallen in love and how much heartbreak they've been through.
This repositioning is part of a creative and critical approach to the politics of attention. The world of information overload and attention scarcity produces distraction as social malaise and attention as its answer. And Malcolm McCulloch um, has an idea that in the era of changing planetary circumstances, personal attention to our immediate surroundings seems like a manageable first step towards some huge cultural shift. And in his consideration of this manageable first step, Malcolm McCulloch, who wrote a book called Ambient Commons, turns to the category of the ambient as a way to start to think about the modality of information in the urban environment. Here, ambient begins to take on more a sense of the situated, where something akin to an atmosphere is brought into focus, rather than existing merely as a background, as in ambient music or ambient light. And so I'm interested in exploring what McCullough states is his key question. Do increasingly situated information technologies illuminate the world or do they just eclipse it? I want to argue for a poetics alert to embodiment, textuality, sonics and technology that enhances awareness and understanding of the intrinsic phenomena of the world that we share. There's already some research uh, from locative media studies in 2008, something that was quoted earlier on in the day, D'Souza and Silver, Silver and Sutko argued that mobiles can be used to connect people with their environments. And in 2010, Jeremy Haidt coined the term locative narrative to describe literatures that are experientially driven, literally and figuratively, as a person moves through space on Earth. What I always felt has been missing from these uh, accounts is a specific attention to the literary. Content here might be understood as, well, just that, content, uh, data, media, narrative, but really understood as story, poetry, or drama. The genres that have self, the self-conscious force of the literary. Indeed, the role of the writer has been underrepresented as content has become the word for the meaning-making functions of digital delivery platforms. This is significant because it has to do with how newly emergent forms get adopted and how they spread. Writers, poets and dramatists could be forgiven for not recognising themselves in a field dominated by instrumental information systems designed to manage environments to maximum efficiency. Uh, um, in other words, the, the, uh, the literary has not always been welcomed into the... Um, um, the digital, the, 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 the digital information infrastructure. So it's clear, isn't it, that the category of the ambient has a lack of definition, a certain fuzziness as a key quality. Flat fields where figure and ground merge and distinctions are dissolved. So I want to make a move here from this lack of definition understood in the critiques of ambience as either aesthetic advantage or critical problem within McCulloch's context of the, the, the problem of information overload in, in sa information-saturated environments. I want to make a move that refigures this kind of fuzziness as ambiguity, and I want to think about ambiguity understood, understood as an aesthetic tactic for interaction, a central quality of the appeal of what we propose as interactive art experiences of all kinds. So the ambient here, I want to argue, is far from a, uh, it's not a retreat from discursive production. It's a deliberate creative strategy of ambiguity that draws readers and listeners into an interaction and into an awareness of the systems that they inhabit and co-constitute, the political, cultural, ecological and technological systems that we all live within. To do that, I want to return to where I began with the necessity of getting a bit lost and to think about ambiguity in that context. Ambiguity is not a mode of experience that one might normally associate from computing-based experiences. Computers present themselves as rational machines, subject to the laws of maths and physics. And in truth, I don't actually really want an ambiguous experience when I fire up, fire up my email system or my Excel spreadsheet in the morning. That's why I said at the beginning, I'm kind of talking about art. But when it comes to art and culture, the situation is different. Here, it's hard to resist William Empson's 
or I have found it hard to resist, William Empson's famous excavation of ambiguity as a key to literary experience. Um, Empson wrote a book in 1930 that some of you who were forced to read as English lit undergraduates many years ago called Seven Types of Ambiguity. And I'm ripping off his framework, really, for this talk. Um, elucidating the meanings evoked in a line from a Shakespeare sonnet, William Empson wrote, um, these reasons and many more relating the simile to its place in the sonnet must all combine to give the line its beauty. And there is a sort of ambiguity in not knowing which of them to hold most clearly in mind. Clearly this is involved in all such richness and heightening of effect. And the, machin the machinations of ambiguity are among the very roots of poetry. I like that idea of uh, not knowing which of the ambiguous meanings of something is most important and which one to hold in mind. And I like the idea that actually what happens when you're having an interesting art experience is something, something, something's going on around not, not being clear about what the interpretation is. Empson's account of ambiguity underlines the necessity for interpretive effort, leading not to reducible or translatable sense, but to the absolute necessity for contradiction, compression, and associative suggestion in the literary work of art. Contradiction, compression, and associative suggestion. Over the past 15 years, I've undertaken and enjoyed quite a lot of creative production using contextual awareness, location, and interruption. I have been moved, I've cried, I've laughed, I've, had, I've been completely overexcited, I've got very buzzed up, I've enjoyed quite a lot of these kinds of artworks. And so I've begun to formulate my own seven types of ambiguity that I think are essential machinations for the new poetics of ambient literature and interactive art experiences. Firstly, ambiguous affect, and this is kind of where it starts. It's the ambiguity of what we might call prehension. Uh, by this I mean the gap between input and output in our own perceptual systems, which is especially heightened in an interactive artwork between a user and an, amb an, amb an ambiguous um, device. Um, this is the feeling of being a bit lost, actually, being a little bit confused. It can easily topple into frustration, especially if the tech crashes. <laughs> but uh, when it works, uh, the literary is produced in this moment as an event at the overlap between the systems of the site itself, where you are, the systems of the device and the network, the textual system that you're experiencing, and our own perceptual systems. Affective responses arise in this sense of indeterminacy that characterizes the click, walk, listen, read, swipe interface that we do when we do an interactive art experience of this kind. Uh, secondly, um, the ambiguous interface. Um, although the object of HCI and uh, user experience design is to make the interface transparent, clear, and not confusing, like these old examples, part of my excitement and pleasure in any interactive object is figuring it out, wondering if I'm doing it right. Is this the right way to do it? Is it working properly? Um, this is, what, is this what I'm supposed to do? Uh, I used to think this was just a frustrating design inadequacy that would get ironed out in the future. But now it seems to me to actually be constitutive uh, of the whole experience and to be a really important quality of the whole experience. And actually, this has been written about in HCI. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting little, little tradition in human-computer interaction design um, by um, Bill Gaver and Steve Benford, who's from Nottingham University and one of the uh, leading experts really in mixed reality experiences in this country, indeed probably in the world, um, in which they, they elaborate methods for producing um, ambiguity in a paper that they wrote in 2003 called Ambiguity as a Resource for Design. Ambiguity, they said, uh, uh, should be used in order to be intriguing, mysterious and delightful. Intriguing, mysterious and delightful, that's not bad, is it? By impelling, by impelling people to interpret situations for themselves, it encourages them to start grappling conceptually with systems and their contexts, and thus to establish deeper and more personal relations with the meanings offered by those systems. Uh, and these insights were later developed by Phoebe Sengers and Bill Gaver um, in a 2006 
paper arguing for multiple interpretations, by Matthew Chalmers' ideas about seamful design, and more recently by Steve Benford and Gabriel Giannacci uh, writing about uncomfortable interactions uh, at CAR in 2012. So there is a slight but significant tradition that values um, a, a lack of reductivist clarity in order to produce specific kinds of engagement by using ambiguity. Uh, thirdly, um, I want to talk about ambiguous sensing. The sensor systems that trigger content are not actually 100% prompt or accurate. They're more mm, atmospheric than that. GPS, particularly in the early days of mobile media, didn't feel like a precise system at all. Back then, the accuracy for placing a piece of content on a map, as it were, was around about five meters when I first started working with this field about 15 years ago. So you had about a five, minute, a five meter either way space where you might find the content. That meant that creators often managed the user experience through a series of fades and mixes between zones. And this mixology quickly learned to work hand in hand with an audio base level, a sound bed that specific instances of sound content faded in and out of because you didn't have the accuracy to jump from one to the other. And finally, these instances of the creation of a sound bed learnt to balance themselves with or against the ambient sound of the actual environment of the world that you were actually in at any one point where the work was being experienced. So the emergency siren, the overhead plane, the gravel path crunch all start to appear inside the locative sound work. So the ambience of such works consisted in a rather subtle art of the mix in which real world sounds, crossfades and audio balancing accompanied the user through these rather fuzzily defined and not always obvious zones. I should say that this has uh, changed quite a lot over the years, especially with the use of um, headphones that actually exclude the sound of the world that you're actually in and that creates a slightly different kind of effect in some ways. Um, these works produce what I can only call ambient experiences where the user is drifted through a sonic and literary space that works with the world surrounding us but doesn't map it, pin it, or even necessarily navigate it. Fourthly, there are also ambiguous mappings. Following on from the above, the experience of uh, 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 interactive artworks of this kind may often but not always involve moving or walking through spaces and places. These works may give you a strict map, like a heritage app, observe on the right, etc., etc., or they may give you a more ambiguous set of instructions, like Blast Theory's piece, Rider Spoke, in which participants are given a bicycle with a pair of headphones and a GPS device. The soundtrack invites readers to find a special place in the city. It asks us to decide who we want to be in this experience, to rename ourselves. We are then prompted to recall memories. Remember a time where you last held hands. Go there, record and locate a memory for other riders to discover. And this is quoting from their website. Cycling through the streets, your focus is outward, looking for good places to hide, speculating about the hiding places of others, becoming completely immersed into this overlaid world as the voices of strangers draw you into a new and unknown place. Every good walk deserves getting a little bit lost. That's not from their website. Fifthly, uh, ambiguous um, embodiment. The interface mappings above produce a situated experience of being connected in this here and now and to this here and now, but being connected to other places and other experiences. This is a literary endeavor, but it also spatializes and embodies literary experience. The body is here and the text knows where the reader's body is, but it can use that environment to invite the reader to also be elsewhere. Being elsewhere is the perpetual offer of theater, film and uh, screen experience. This offer, like VR, asks us to leave our actual bodies behind and the position of our actual bodies is meant to be irrelevant in a darkened cinema or a darkened theatre. 
For in the case of ambient literature, the position of the body is the heart of the practice. I am here right now reading or listening in this place, but I'm also reading or listening to someone else who is somewhere else, but he's also in this here and in this right now. My body is here, fully sentient and aware of its surroundings, but the text is augmenting it, especially through the intimacy of the headphone experience and what that does to your uh, neuro, neuro, neuro uh, perceptual system, uh, and engaging it with other presences in this here and now. So I can feel as though, although I'm here, my body is also having an experience of being elsewhere. So the positioning of my body in time and space becomes um, ambiguous in some way. Uh, six, the ambiguity of exp exploration. This diagram, this diagram is a bit weird. This diagram is a kind of, this diagram is, is the results of an eye, traffic, uh, eye tracking exploration uh, for, for looking at Mondrian. Where, where do people look when they look at a Mondrian? Um, I got quite interested in eye tracking experiments for a while. Um, to explore is to be uncertain. Um, certain artworks require exploration. They require active interaction. They require walking or clicking or navigating. Um, in eye tracking studies of the way we look at visual art, neuroscientists started to show that in a figurative work of art, most people's eyes conform to some predictable patterns of scanning eyes, face, body, foreground, background. So we sort of go eyes, face, body, background, foreground, or foreground, background. There's a kind of predict... And if you, if you map on the squiggles of where people look, they tend to be quite consistent in when it's a figurative uh, image. But in abstract art, something much more interesting <laughs> starts to happen. There's an, there's an enormous variation. People's eye tracking goes everywhere, which raises the question of what we do when we look at abstract art in that way. As our eyes scan over a canvas, we might be said to be having an experience of our own individual perceptual systems. We're experiencing our own sense-making apparatus. We're going, what's that? How's that? What's going on? How can I make sense of this? How can I compose this? What do I get from this? We're, what we're doing is actually listening to our, our self-making sense of what's put in front of us. We're experiencing ourselves, in fact. I think something similar is happening for me when I'm called upon to explore an interactive work of art in this way. I'm asked to put some of myself into the interaction. I'm asked to step forward into an unknown, and I'm asked to discover how it feels. And seven, um, something about the language of contingency. Um, we haven't done the full analysis of this in the Ambient Lit Project, but already I know from what I know about this field of work and what I've worked with before that there are certain kinds of um, words and phrases that crop up all the time. It's a sort of language of contingency, of conditionality and of subjunctiveness. You may want to, you might, you could, perhaps this may be the case. The language linking the internal affective world and the external world of reality is tentative and suggestive and necessarily reflects and produces the ambiguity of the whole experience. So ambiguity and ambience is a tactic to produce mixed realities the interface with our technological context and our mediatized environments without effacing the actual world that we all share. It seems to me that as though we could think of it or start to think of it as a way of creating oppositional critical wor works of art in the world of data and the world of smart cities and the world of the virtual. Mixed reality artworks that locate themselves not in some second life, but in the exactly back and forth movement between worlds and states at the intersection of bodies, sites, data and devices. This movement between text and world is constructed in the history of reading, as uh, Tom was talking about this morning, as being distraction. But here, through the dynamics of the, here though, the dynamics of distraction become a way of perhaps remaining present to the world. So what this form of art can do is actually draw our attention to our attention, where attention is what's at stake. So I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs>